Hey, everybody, welcome to View from the Top podcast, where we help growth minded men who desire momentum in their business, their family, and their finances get through the valleys and up the mountain to their very own View from the Top. Again, I am glad that you're listening today. My name is Wally. And before I get Big A in here today, uh, we're going to be hitting kind of an awkward but super important topic today, and I can't wait for y'all to be able to listen to this. I would encourage you to listen all the way through, because when we get to the end, Big A and I are going to actually share some things that we've learned from our own experiences related to intimacy and sex in our marriages, and I know you're not going to want to miss that. So let's get uh, our host with the most in here, Big A. Are you scared? Wally? I'm fired up, man. I can't wait to talk about this. You're scared scared. to death, right? (laughs) I'm not scared in the least. I'm pretty excited to talk about this, quite honestly. (laughs) Why are you so scared? What what are you afraid of? Oh, man, this is... uh... This is a sensitive topic. I mean, even as we get into it, it's pretty obvious right from the start that we've had some similarities, but I mean, we have some big differences just in, in, in our marriages related to intimacy and, and, uh, yeah. So they're, uh, why it's going to be good, I think, but I'm a little nervous. Scared is the wrong word. Maybe I'm just nervous. If you got a more important topic you want to talk about than this, I'm. (laughs) No, man, let's go. I'm interested. Hey, before we do though, I want to ask you a couple of questions. Like, I know you and I both share the same desire to do little random acts of kindness, right? Mm. It's fun to do little things. Not a lot of money. I'm not talking about a big deal. I'm talking about buying somebody's meal or giving them 20 bucks for doing this or that. I was so encouraged this past week. I got to spend a little bit of time with a family member and uh, just watching how they interacted with some of the staff at the hospital. Uh, Mm. She was sitting there coloring on this little book and Uh, I don't know that that age demographic's really into coloring now. I don't understand that. But anyway, whatever it is. And one of the nurses commented on how much they liked that. And so, you know, she bought this coloring book, had it delivered to her. And then Friday night, she ordered pizza for all the staff on the floor. And I don't know. I thought it was pretty cool. I was just like, man, this is so... How do you decide... Like, is it spirit led? Is it, do you have a certain amount of money set aside or a certain amount of time that you're willing to invest? Like, how do you determine to do these little random acts of kindness? Yeah. I, well, first of all, I don't do enough. And uh, Sonia, my wife, is a huge help to me in this area. She just, she notices things and sees things that I don't. And uh, I'm very grateful for that. Uh, one thing I do do pretty frequently, I say frequently, like we don't go out you know, every night of the week or anything. But often we go to a restaurant. I've noticed that I tend to pay attention to people that are underserved or undernoticed. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, for example, uh, I'll talk about the restaurant thing. Well, I'll talk about restaurant. So go to a restaurant and you get like, you know, less than or kind of mediocre average service. Uh, that's great. You know, you leave a tip and you're good you get on your way. But often enough, you know, maybe once a month or so if we're out, Like if we go out once a week or a couple times a week, if we're out once a month or so, there'll be an experience where you have with like a waiter or waitress that just, they do a phenomenal job, like super help. We just had the experience at our favorite local uh, Mexican restaurant a couple weeks ago. And this, this particular server was super helpful, like offering it. We've been been going there for months and didn't even know they had these sauces that they just bring out for you. It's like crazy. And so at the end, what I like to do is when they go to like, give me the check or whatever, I'll be like, Hey, uh, his name was Jesus. So I said, hey, Jesus, would you mind getting your your manager and bringing him back here with you? And um, it's funny, sometimes they're too scared to come back with him and he didn't this time. So the manager says, he's, the manager's are always funny. They're always tempted when they show up. They're like, so uh, is everything okay? You know, I'm like, man, I just want you to know, I wish, I said, I wish Jesus was with you because I wanted to tell him, you know, in front of you that uh, he just did a fantastic job, did an amazing mm-hmm. job. Mm. And uh, he's like, well, well, thank you. You can see the, like the blood uh, just kind of drains yeah, out of their face, right? right? Uh, and then you got to back that up with leaving like a little better tip than normal, right? right. Otherwise, it's right. it's. I think that adds to it. But same kind of thing. Like uh, you ever go to like big events where some person has the awful responsibility? I know they're getting paid, but still have the awful responsibility of like cleaning up after all of us. Mm-hmm. Whether that's janitorial or like some type of rest restroom service or something. Mm-hmm. 
I always try to make a point. I'm not perfect at it, but I always try to make a point of just getting their attention, looking them in the eye, saying, thank you for doing this. It makes it so much easier for the rest of us. They just look at you like, thank you. <laughs> like, yeah, they, like, they don't even know what to say. No, they don't. <laughs> and so, yeah. And that doesn't cost anything. It's just human no. kindness. Yeah. Right. Imagine if more of us did things like that. Yeah, we need to do that. You know, we even have a little document, 101 Random Acts of Kindness, that we'll have in the show notes that you can download if you're interested in getting that, just to give you some ideas on how you can do that. It changes the dynamics of the room. I noticed with this staff at the hospital, they acted differently. They were more friendly. They were more talkative. You know, it's like, hey, you buy a little pizza, you order a coloring book, You know, you just enter into this personal dialogue with people rather than being all stone-faced and never sharing, never offering compliments. And I don't know, that's the way I choose to do life. I love it like that because it just adds a little bit of flair. Well, speaking of adding a little bit of flair, (laughs) uh, we've got a a, a topic that's going to add a little bit of flair. And I want to dive right into it because I think it's important And the title of this is, Is a Sexless Marriage Really a Marriage? And this is not original by me. One of our members in ISI posted this question to me or posed this question to me. And I was like, man, that's really an interesting question. Is a sexless marriage really a marriage? And I thought, man, we're going to dive into this in the podcast. We're going to break it down a little bit. I just want to say, though, right out of the gate, Wally nor I are counselors. We're not a psychologist. We're not sex therapists. But what I am excited about, Wally, if you think about this, we're getting old, man. Combined, we have 75 years of marriage experience. So we can talk on sex a little bit, right? 75 well, I think years. We try to be avid users. <laughs> uh, we do. We do. You, the better, more you practice, the better you get at this topic. And so uh, we want to really uh, kind of dive in. But I do want to say a couple things related to this topic, though. Yeah. I want to be sensitive to this. I understand that there's a lot of listeners out there that may have physical or emotional limitations that really uh, we want to be sensitive to, right? We can't just throw a blanket over this topic and say this applies to everybody because there's a lot of things going on in our bodies and in our emotions that really are distractions. So we're sensitive to that. We want you as the audience to know that we're sensitive to that. Uh, We we just want to say that This is an important topic. It's something that guys really want to talk about quite a bit because, right, it's important in our marriage. And so, but we do want to kind of put that caveat out and just say that we're we're very sensitive to that. Yeah, I think I think there's probably more uh, men too, uh, not just women, but more men and women than we probably want to admit that have some types of sexual trauma or unhealthy choices related to sexual intimacy. While they're growing up, and I think uh, those, for many people that have those wounds and scars, they just don't go away, um, you know, over time, like we hope they do, for many people on their own. And so, uh, as part of this, like, let's, we are being sensitive to that along the way. You know, it's, a lot of people might be asking, man, why in the world are we talking about this on View from the Top podcast? And after having... Iron Sharpens Iron Mastermind for a decade now. We've had hundreds of men go through ISI, and many of the people are still here that were here originally. And invariably, you know, there's a lot of conversation about sex. There's a lot of conversation about money. There's a lot of conversation about how we raise our kids. And we want to talk about issues that are important. And I know that we're going to have some fun today. We're going to kind of tease and cut up. But it's a serious topic. It's a serious issue. And it doesn't matter uh, where you're at in your marriage, whether you've only been married a year, whether you've been married like me, 44 years almost, and you are 30 plus years being married. uh, It's important. This topic is always at the forefront of our thoughts. It's always something that's going to take place uh, in our marriage. And I just thought it was a, a worthy topic to discuss today. No, I'm good with that. I think uh, somebody might think, man, it's a view from the top like this. You guys usually talk about business topics. And I think that uh, we're very aware that there's, we talk about the five common areas, right? Five mm-hmm. pillars of our lives and personal and spiritual and relational is one of them. And so yeah. uh, we don't, we don't want to miss something that uh, frankly, 
you know, you said most guys thought this is a top of mind, top of mind uh, topic out of, you know, three things usually. You know, usually you teach out of your wounds. Mm. And uh, I'll be honest with you. I'll just go ahead and say it, get it out of the way. Uh, I was pretty selfish uh, in our physical relationship when I first got married. Um, it was a battle for us uh, in the beginning because I was pretty selfish. Now, fortunately, uh, going to make some guys envious and jealous here. That's never been a real difficult topic for Robin and I in regards to both of our interest level, mm -hmm. right? I want to say that is modesty and tactfully sure. as I can say it. But the truth is, it's it's really been important for both of us in our marriage. But I was selfish, you know, in the things I wanted, the way I wanted it, when I wanted it. And uh, it wasn't until about 15, 20 years into our marriage that we really ran up against the wall with this topic and had to sit down and have some real honest conversation around it. And it didn't go easy to be honest with you, because I remained pretty selfish in regards to that. And so it took us going to a counselor. It took us, you know, discussing with friends. Uh, it, it really uh, was, was a challenge for us to work through. And even though it was good for both of us and we both were interested, uh, I'm just admitting I was selfish in regards to that. I don't know. Uh, what about you? Is that, was that a different experience for you? Was it similar? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give my response to that in a second, but but even before I do that, a question back to you on that. Like when you say you're se you were selfish, mm -hmm. what does that mean? Like what did that look yeah. like? Yeah, it meant uh, I wanted physical intimacy when I wanted it and as often as I wanted it. And I wanted it the way I wanted it, right? And so we won't get too explicit here no, in point. regards to those things. But the point is, is that it was as often as I wanted it, the way I wanted it, and how I wanted it. And so uh, Robin uh, is a very giving person, and she wanted to, you know, meet my desires, wanted to meet my needs, and those kind of things. But we can all be selfish to a point where you push the envelope. And it was like, hey, we got to talk about this a little bit, because it seems like that you're more focused on your desires mm -hmm. than you are being the servant leader to me as a wife. And uh, seems like your focus is a little little off. And it was. I admitted it. I said, yeah, you're right. And I tried and I tried. <clears throat> and it wasn't until I really got people around me, sense of accountability, you know, some people that could really help me understand the value and the importance, looking at it from a different perspective, uh, that I was able to change my mindset as it related to physical intimacy. Wow. Yeah, for me, it's uh, the sexual intimacy has been quite a journey. Uh, as you mentioned, you know, been working on 31 years of marriage. And, um, you know, I think that for me, uh, man, just being completely vulnerable. Uh, it's a weird, I'm just going to say some things that I don't, don't want to say out loud, frankly. But, um, you know, introduced to pornography at the age of eight years old and uh, became part of my life up through, uh, uh, you know, my teenage years and then early in college and and getting married, uh, you know, I love my dads, um, but not a lot of uh, guidance there um, from them. And and so you learned what you learned through uh, through pornography, frankly. And that was that was my experience. And so that created a very selfish um, mindset for me uh, going into marriage and then, Getting married um, at, at 20, got married. I know you got married young too. And getting married young, uh, my, uh, my my wife had um, had some things happen to her when she was little that uh, some uh, some sexual abuse that happened to her. And so she brought that into, um, I was aware of it, but, but I didn't know what that meant, uh, bringing that into our marriage. And so even the first year of our marriage, uh, uh, sexual intimacy was was very rocky, and uh, I made some terrible choices uh, at the end of the day. And um, I had an affair, and our first just over our first year in a marriage. And so uh, God was so gracious and merciful. Uh, Sonia was very kind, and you know, over a period of a few months, 
uh, we were able to to get back together and 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 continue in marriage. And uh, <laughs> like, but that was uh, the journey right then was like a year in our marriage, and it was probably another. Uh, it was it was a living hell for the next mm. uh, ten years. We didn't know what we were doing. Didn't have the help available. Didn't know where to get help. Help available to us. So uh, it created all kinds of chaos in our in marriage. And we started having kids. And and uh, I remember even in two thousand four. So we married in ninety one. I'm sorry, ninety three. So two thousand four. It's eleven years later. We just built a house. We had three three little girls inside the house, and it was a Saturday afternoon. And I was working on the finishing up the garage. Uh, working on some some sheetrock and stuff, and she comes out and and she's like, you know, hey, I think uh, I think I think we're done. I don't know what to do. And I'm like, I think we're done too. Like, I don't know what to do. And um, there's a whole story there, maybe for a different episode, but that was kind of the turning point for us in terms of like we didn't want our marriage to end, so we knew we had to do something, and so mm-hmm. we just kept pursuing, kept pursuing, and, and God started to bless and. And so this whole time, it's literally been been married for just over 30 years, and it's only been the last 18 months of our marriage where we've started to begin to understand mm-hmm. intimacy in our marriage, like sexual intimacy mm-hmm. and, and even real emotional intimacy. I have some things I'll mention later in the episode of uh, some things I've learned and I'm learning around this. And uh, so... Wally, yeah. let's go back for a second. Let's go back for sure, a second. Sure, there's a lot there. So I don't yeah, have time today. I, I have time covered. No, we'll, we'll do it uh, on a different episode. We'll really break that down, and we fully intend to. But uh, if you had had better education, physical intimacy, better education early on, do you think you could have dodged some of these landmines in your marriage? Like, you you were there trying to figure it out on your own. Son, you brought some baggage to the marriage related to previous experiences as a child and you had had some uh, pornography addictions. That was a recipe for disaster right out of the gate. hundred percent. Do you think that it would have been far greater had someone taken an interest in you, some mentor, uh, some trusted advisors, uh, even your fathers could have walked alongside you and educated you better do you feel like that would have kept you from going down some of the paths that you went down? I mean, I think hindsight being twenty twenty, we all like to think so. Yeah, right. I want. Yeah, you I don't, don't want, know. I, 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 I want to believe that for sure. Yeah. Um, here's what I know to be true, though. I didn't have it, so I wasn't even able to have the opportunity to try differently. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I was, you know, I was a believer then. And she and Sonia was a believer. So it's not like we didn't know. Believers are not exempt from no, I problematic mean, not situations at all. in their marriage. Not at all. But <laughs> a lot not. of times we think, right? That we mm. think, well, you know, they're 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 Christians, so they probably don't have those. No, oh, no, yeah. No, no. <laughs> Christians have got it all figured out. Not right? at all, man. Not at Wrong. all. Wrong. Yeah. Well, the thing I'm trying to heighten our awareness that we don't know what we don't know. You're right. And we need to subject ourselves to the scrutiny of people around us that love us, that are willing to walk with us, people that are interested in pouring into us. And we got to pursue that. You got to look for that. It's just not going to come looking for you saying, oh, I think I'm going to mentor you or I think I'm going to pour into you. We've got to have that desire within us, regardless of our age, whether you're 20 years old getting married, whether you're 40 years old and you're an entrepreneur whether you're 63 years old, soon to be, like me, we always are on a journey of learning, and we've got to be pursuing that as we go. I know one of the questions that you and I were talking about before we started recording was, what does sexless (laughs) even mean, right? we got to identify that. Like, what are we going to say? What is a sexless marriage? Yeah, I I don't I don't know. I mean, you could could take it as far, because that was the question. The question that came in was like, you know, Right. Is, is a sexless marriage a marriage? And and so I, I go to immediately you say sex less like means zero. Zero, right? And I, I'm not sure that was the intent of the question. It's not. It's no. not. It just means is are you on a good cadence with that yeah. your relationship? And some guys, we can't put a number, right? We can't say this is good. Like everybody's got to work that out on your own. And that's another important topic related to this is 
Wally's experience is different from mine. Mine's going to be different from everyone listening. And so you've got to figure out what works for your relationship. That's the reason that we want to do this is to get the conversation started, just to get you thinking about what is good for our relationship and have the dialogue and be able to figure that out. I don't know. Some guys may say, hey, ever not is sexless, you know, <laughs> instead of two a day or, you know, like, I don't know what that is for you. You've got to make your own discernment in regards to what a sexless marriage is. But I'm sure everybody listening to this can make that determination within their own marriage. Yeah, for sure. Uh, we talk about what sexless is. I think it's important to talk to you about, you know, why is sex important? Um, you know, there, there have been times in my marriage where, uh, you know, my wife didn't understand why that was important. And I, I know there's a lot of guys out there even listening to this podcast that are in that boat right now. Sure. No <laughs> there question. just are. No question. Bro. Right? So why is it important? Yeah, I, I think the obvious first reason is is we got to build our family, right? <laughs> <It's gotta> populate <laughs> the you. planet, man. I don't know about you, but, uh, you know, those kids just didn't show up, right? And so I think that without a question, it's that, but the other thing that's really important to both sides, right, it's not just guys, but it's women as well, is the physical and emotional bonding. Mm -hmm. And I remember when Robin and I got married, you know, you were young. I was younger. I was 19. Robin had just graduated from high school two weeks prior, okay? She had just turned 18 in March, and we got married June 21st of that same year. And our pastor, we had two pastors that married us, James Binkley and uh, Robin's pastor that was uh, a great guy. Uh, I didn't know him that well, but Robin wanted him involved in the ceremony. But I remember James Binkley, my pastor, uh, since I was a kid, uh, took Robin and I aside, did a little premarital counseling, and he went through everything like he did. But when he got to this topic, he said, I want to tell you all something. He said, uh, you're young and you're aggressive and you're energetic and sex is going to be good and all that. And there'll be challenges related to that throughout your marriage. But he said, I want to tell you something. He said, if the bedroom is not right, nothing in your marriage is going to be right, comparatively speaking, how it could be. Mm. And he said, I just want to urge y'all to really think through and what that physical intimacy looks like because it's going to, and I didn't get it then, obviously, right? Because we weren't married yet and I didn't get it. But you know, that's proven to be true throughout our marriage because every little thing seems like a big thing when we're not physically intimate. But when we are physically intimate, God designed it that way. There's some things that goes on in our bodies that just allows us to look at things differently. And so Robin and I talk about that often. Mm -hmm. Like, I'll be a little edgy, and she'll go, yeah, okay, I understand, I get it. It's, we laugh about it. It's a topic for us. We just tease about it. But it's true, and that's really stuck with me. The other thing is the communication and vulnerability in our marriage. And you need to really think through what it is that you're trying. Our partners are not mind readers, mm. right? They just can't know what you're thinking, what your desires are. We're all different. Everybody is different listening to this podcast. And you need to communicate that. But the other thing is, is it's the most vulnerable thing you could possibly participate in, mm -hmm. right? And so you've got to be willing and able to be vulnerable. You've got to be willing to communicate and talk. Like, it's even silly. We're having fun talking today on this podcast, but it's a little awkward, right? It's a little strange, and it feels that way in your marriage. And you and I were talking before we started recording, you know, is like I've got a little more marriage, you know, than a lot of the people that are going to be listening to this, and we're more mature and we can handle things better. I wish someone had done this episode for me when I'd been married two years or five years or 10 years, and I could have taken some of that wisdom and applied it to my marriage, and I could have, you know, dodged some of these trials that we've had to experience as a result of it. And so you just got to get okay with going through the communication that you need to. And Robin used to say oftentimes, now, I can't read your mind. I don't know what you're thinking unless you tell me. And the same goes for her, right? And we see things differently. We communicate differently, and we just have to be willing to have that kind of... The other thing that I wanted to mention is the stress reduction that it does 
give us. You know, there, there's a hormone called oxytocin. Oxytocin. I'll get it right here in a second. Oxytocin. <laughs> it's your, that's a whole different thing. Man. I think it's a drug. That's a whole different thing. Yeah, oxytocin. Let's not, let's not do that one. It does yeah, not oxytocin. produce that. Like it, just... it, it doesn't. It doesn't. But <laughs> you may need some oxycontin if this goes too long without it. But oxytocin, it does. It is, so it's a hormone that, it's a stress hormone that our body releases. And so... Yeah, these are just some reasons that sex is important, and I'm sure there's other reasons that you have as well, but those are just some things that we were thinking about as we were putting together what this episode could look like. Yeah. So even even though what we've talked about already, right, we've talked about why sex is important, and even those few little four or five things that you mentioned, what if husband and wife are not on the same page? with those of why it's important? You know, the truth is you're probably not going to be on the same page on all these. Mm. The truth. I mean, I'd like to say, oh, yeah, I'm going to sit down with, <laughs> Here's with the formula. Robin tonight. That's what we Here's should have titled formula. this. Formula right. for, yeah. Uh, you know. Yeah. 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 More sex in your marriage or whatever. <laughs> but uh, you're probably not. And it's because we think differently. We, we came to the marriage with different baggage, as we pointed out earlier. Uh, our filters are different. Our desires are different. Uh, what we value is different, right? And so you're probably not going to, don't be some selfish pig like I was for the first 10 or 15 years of your marriage. Go into it open and think, why aren't we on the same page? What is it? And we need to work really to uncover that reason. I don't know. It could be trust. It could be wounds that we're going through. It could be different desires. There's just not one size fits all. I mean, this is a very subjective conversation that you're going to have with your spouse, and you're just going to have to figure out what is the underlying current. What is it that you're dealing with that disallows you? You know, during that period, Robin and I had some very close friends that we went and talked to. We were like, hey, we got to talk through this, you know, and uh, we have people at our church that we talk to. We later, you know, Floyd Dawson, I give him the credit for saving our marriage. He's a local counselor. And Robin would go talk to him. I would go talk to him. We'd go talk to him together. Uh, and it was just so that we could be honest. Wally, here's the thing that happens. We push this under the rug. We're like, well, it'll get better. Well, it'll get better. Well, it'll get better. It's just not going to get better. You're just not going to wake up one day and this challenge be resolved. You've got to be able to go to your partner and say, hey, you know what? We think different. I don't know if it's trust or filters or the way we're, I don't know what it is. And put them in a position that's safe to have this dialogue. Give them permission to share their honest feelings. I always say as a coach, I coach people, uh, every single day almost, and I'll say, what is it that you're lying to yourself about that you really know the truth? And that's the way this topic is. You're always telling yourself it's going to get better, it's going to work out, you know, when the kids get a little older, when the kids get out of school, when the kids get out of college, when we're empty nesters. And I'm just going to encourage you, it's not going to change without some dialogue. It, we, you're just going to need to do this. And you're maybe going to need to talk to a few people individually, go to the counselors, uh, go to the people that can help you work through this. But don't put your partner in a corner where they come out fighting. You, you want to give your partner permission to disagree. And the worst thing you can do is start defending yourself, right? Well, I do this and I do that and you don't have to do this and this is all I want you. You go down that path, you're never going to resolve it. But when you go to your partner and, you know, take away all of the defenses you know, don't don't use yourself as the main reason, but you want to have this communication. You want to have the vulnerability. You want to be able to love them and have the intimacy that God designed us to have as a result of great communication. Speaking about that, there is, uh, you know, coming from a defensive position, I think I've done this before in my marriage numbers of times, um, is that I try to position it to, to kind of get what I want out of it, right? Mm. Uh, that selfish part, right? And, and a lot of it is because we don't know what else to do, frankly. Like, I just being, like, I recognize that God designed this in, in marriage, and he designed it, obviously, for procreation. Uh, but 
he didn't have to make it fun. <laughs> he could have made well, it. He so, did, and I'm glad he did. I'm glad right? he did too. But if if it was just meant for that, in my opinion, sure. then it's like you did it, you have kids, and you're done. And that's not the way yeah, it works. Yeah. And so no, there's more no. to it than just, hey, we had our kids, and so you know, we don't right. do that in marriage anymore. It's not important or any of that kind of stuff. And so, but when we get in my experience, from my own my own experience, is that there have been times when I've tried to use whether it's a book or whether it's even the Bible sometimes, right? That there's truths in God's word. You've, you've got some written down here that you're going to cover. And I think even as we read these, it's really, really important that this is God's design and this is like his, his best practice for us as couples. Um, but this doesn't mean that you walk away today with this scripture and go write this and on a piece of paper and hand it to your wife tonight. And you're like, well, this is no. what these guys said on this yeah. podcast today. Like yeah. you got, th yeah. that's not the, that's not the context or the no. heart in any of this. No. I think what you're going to share. From, you're going to make it worse. Yeah. You go do that. You're going to make it worse. Cause you're just trying to get what you want. Right. It's not about yeah, that's what's the wrong important. Motive. It's what yeah. you want. Now it's about, we're going to talk about what's most important a little bit, but like that's, if that's what you're going to do, then if that's what we do at all, it's really about us and not yeah. about, it's about me, not about us. Yeah. Here's the thing is that uh, Wally and I both are Christian by faith and we run our lives, we run our business, we run Iron Sharpens Iron Mastermind based on these principles. That doesn't mean our audience is all Christian. There's people in our community that are various faiths. And so I'm just stating from our position, this is where we get our truth from and our fifth core values, truth before opinion. And truth is established in God's word for us. And for us, there's just a couple of scripture I wanted to mention. One of them is Hebrews 13, four. It says, marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. And really, this verse is emphasizing the sanctity of marriage and the importance of fidelity. That is the reason that God's given us this verse. He said that it really is suggesting that sexual relations within the bounds of marriage are honorable, but actions outside of those bounds, like adultery, sexual immorality, are not. Mm -hmm. And this is where we base a lot of our... Uh, desires from that God's given us to point back and to say, hey, am I operating within the confines of God's word? First Corinthians 7, 3 through 5 says, the husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have the authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. Do not deprive each other except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. You know, these are powerful verses, and it shows that servant mentality that we should have for each other. This passage really emphasizes the mutual responsibility and the consent in marital relationships, and it really speaks to the importance of regular intimacy in marriage, and it warns against prolonged abstinence, which could lead to temptation. Can I ask you a question right there? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, and I, I this is... I just have a question for you in this. So when we often read this, you know, it's interesting. Most of the time, the the takeaway from this is wives don't deprive your husbands. And that that's honestly, I'm just being, that's what most guys hear, right? That, oh, just, you know, she can't withhold from me. Kind of well, thing. they're selfish. That's the reason but I'm they saying just that's, out a section of that's, it. That's true, but that's when, what it is. They're like, oh, there we go. Now I got ammunition. Right. Now I'll go, yeah. But I think what's really important is this that first of all, realize that the verse actually starts off with the wife should fulfill his marital duty to his wife. The husband should right. fulfill, right? He the, the verse starts off leading with the man toward his wife. Manning up, doing the right thing. And you mentioned intimacy there. There's there's a, obviously we all know this, there's emotional and physical intimacy. They, they're sure. two different things. And stereotypical, man has more of a physical intimacy need. It's where yeah. he, it's what I've learned over the past couple of years that 
why that's so important to me is because God's designed it that way because that's my that's where I feel safe. That physical connection is where I feel most connected to my wife. The right. oneness that he provides through scripture, through marriage, right? That's the oneness. For my wife, though, she doesn't get the same connectedness in the physical. She she enjoys it. She gets it. She can. Sure. But for the most part, most of her intimacy need is met on the emotional side. Most of it. Yeah. Not all of it. Yeah. We both yeah. have physical needs. We both have emotional needs. Sure. But Typically, stereotypically, and there are marriages that are different than this. They're flip flopped. I get that, but most of the time, uh, it's there's there's a, both a physical intimacy and an emotional intimacy. And I don't I don't know if I'm taking this verse out of context or not. And and I don't have the the commentary here right in front of me to read through it. I didn't study it out like you did ahead of time. Is it appropriate to say that it's both physical and emotional? Yeah, I think it is. Uh, absolutely. And I struggle more with the, you know, the, uh, the empathy, the, the, the emotional, the, you know, the contemplative side, the, the feeling side. Like, that's a struggle for me. And uh, I have to work hard at that. And sometimes Robin gets cheated out of that side of it. Right. And sometimes she just says, I need you to sit here with me. I just need you to be with me. And I'm like, okay. This is not leading to anything else. They're like, this is it? <laughs> She's like, she laughs, you know. She goes, yeah, that's it. And I'm like, oh, okay, I get it now. I know the rules of engagement. I got it. But I, I'll joke in aside, that's a struggle for me. And it has been our whole marriage. And I work on it, and I try to give her that. And you're right. Uh, they, they, they need that. And we, we should work hard to give them the things that they need, just like they do for us. So what happens when... The wife or the husband, you know, somebody snubs their nose at this and says, uh, you know what, I'm not, you know, whatever. What What do you say to them? Well, I, first of all, I don't think it's a pass. A lot of times uh, I think we can give ourselves a pass to say, well, you know, if my wife doesn't, is willing to understand me. Do this, right. She doesn't see this as important. Um, and you know, hey, I showed her these Bible verses. <laughs> so, right. And so she's not lining up. And and so does this, you know, I have, now I can go look at porn to satisfy mm. my physical. Oh uh, my I don't agree with that at all. No. Um, you know, what about an affair? Uh, you know, if I go find that somewhere else, because she's not giving it to me and it's a need and the Bible's clear and like, but Bible is very clear about where it's appropriate. <laughs> right. So right. Like, let's not get confused. And I, we talked about this before, but, I wouldn't lead off with a convo with these passages unless unless you have a healthy relationship, right? You need to back up and start with conversations around what's most important to each of you, right. the different right. parts of your relationship and your married life together. Mm. And I think deciding for yourself what matters to you as a guy. Mm-hmm. Like, do, is the physical intimacy really the thing that matters the most? Mm. In the moment, it sure does feel that way. Mm. In the moment. But I think if we take a step back, is it is it about gentleness and patience that we really want? Like, do we want the fruit of the spirit ourselves in our in our relationships when we don't understand all the pieces yet because we're still trying to figure it out? Um, or is it truly just getting what we want? And I think the maturity part for me is coming. It's getting there. I'm not there all the way yet, but that maturing in me that God's doing is to recognize the the overall intimacy in both the sexual physical and also the emotional sexual part mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. of in our marriage and that matters most like when i can find fulfillment when i can truly find fulfillment in the emotional intimacy that we have together and see it as that to, to label it that that it matters as much in our relationship as the physical, that all of a sudden, like, God's, God's like, rewiring my brain a little bit that takes a lot of that, that selfishness away to be able to see it clearly uh, for what it is. Um, that's the journey that, that I've been on the last, you know, year, uh, 18 months. Well, isn't it cool, though, to get to a place in your marriage, and I want to give some encouragement to guys that are hearing this but don't yet feel it or understand it, 
there's a hollow feelingness to your spirit when it's just physical. Mm-hmm. And there's a really solid unanimity. Is that the word uh, I'm looking for? It, there, there's a union, I guess, is the word I'm looking for. When you have all the components to it, it it's, it's satisfying. The, the other way is just physically gratifying, but it's satisfying when you have all components of the intimacy. And that's the emotional side as well as the physical side. I 100% agree with you. No guy uh, that I'm aware of, unless you're just a really selfish, like you got some, we're all really selfish sometimes, but like you've got a major narcissistic problem. Like I, I think most guys, if they take themselves out of the situation for two seconds, want what's best in their marriage for each other. Right. And the struggle is really about the connection physically and that, that she wants you there, right? Like mm-hmm. you can just have physical release. But if, if you don't believe in your heart that she wants you there, that she wants to be there with you, right. uh, that, that's, that'll mess you up. <laughs> that'll mess you up real good. Yeah, it will. It'll show up later too. That's yeah. the thing. It'll show up in your relationship later. And that's what we don't want to do. I want to give some ways that Robin and I have found that's been good for us. And we've learned mm-hmm. this over the years. I'm not saying it's going to be great for your relationship. If it is, okay, implement it. If it's not, yeah. then discard it. But some of the things that have been really good for us is that um, a lady named Faye Lindsay, decades ago now, maybe 30 years ago, shared with Robin that you should make your bedroom your sanctuary. And I didn't really understand that until Robin explained it to me. And what I mean by that is, is that, you know, we, we do a lot of things here for far as promotions go in our business. We'll shoot uh, videos here promoting our business. We'll take pictures here promoting our business. And I'll do business calls outside of the bedroom. Our bedroom is kind of off limits to any and everybody except Robin and I. That's our place. There's no pictures in our bedroom except of Robin and I. There's no children, no grandchildren. Um, It's a place that, uh, that, that, that we reserve. It's just our place. Uh, we, we go to bed at the same time every night together, and we have our whole marriage. Uh, that works for some people. Some people it doesn't. But for us, uh, it, it's really worked well. Um, we don't ever argue in our bedroom. Uh, we've said that it needs to be a safe place. Now, we'll set up half the night <laughs> in the den, right, and we'll duke it out. I don't know why we do this, but we stand around the island in our kitchen, and we'll have more conversations around that island in our kitchen. But we've both agreed that we're not going to lay in bed and fight and argue and have discussions, right? Our pastor told us when uh, we got married, he said, if you'll eliminate all other distractions in your bedroom outside of sleep, and you'll find a lot more sex. And I was like, you're right. So there's no electronics in our bedroom. I don't work from our bedroom there's no laying in bed, scrolling through Facebook. Uh, we, you know, I put my phone on the charger in the mudroom when I go to bed, pick it up the next day. Uh, it's just for us, that has really, really worked well. The other thing that we've done is really had honest discussions about focusing on each other. And I remember in my pouting days when I was not getting what I wanted. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great way to I, say it, isn't it? It's I remember. so true. <laughs> <laughs> it is true. She could always tell, too. She, she'd be like, and so one day she looked at me and she held my face in her hands and she looked at me and she said, if you would focus on my physical needs and my emotional needs, you might be surprised what would happen. And that is so true. And I'm not... Uh, great at it every time, but for the most part, I try to do that. And oftentimes I get exactly because she wants to satisfy and please me just like I desire and just like I want to do for her. The other thing is for Robin is to listen attentively. She doesn't want, (coughs) excuse me, (coughs) she doesn't want me to just passively listen. She wants to genuinely, she wants me to genuinely pay attention to what she's saying. And then finally, the thing for Robin and I both is, is expressing ourselves clearly. J- just really laying it out there and it's going to sting. And I'm going to warn some of you, don't get off this podcast and go straight in there and spill all the beans. Mm-hmm. Don't do that. 
you, you want to go slow and you want to say, hey, I did listen to a podcast. They had some topics that maybe you'd want to listen to. Maybe we can discuss. And I would encourage you to get your spouse to listen to this podcast. That way they have context to what it is that you're talking about and talking through. So do that and then say, where can we get better? What are some things that we could do to make our marriage the kind of marriage that they're discussing today? So, Wally, I don't know if you've got other things that have worked well for you and Sonia that you could share. Yeah, I I think number one is just always be a student. Um, You know, I'm still learning, and I probably will be, right? You're 63, 64, and you're still still learning. Not that you haven't learned a lot, Mm -hmm. but uh, you're still learning. And so I think that's really important just to remember that it's always a process. It's always something that we're... Uh, understanding better, whether it's our, our faith and our relationships and all of that. So starting with that, it helps a lot of other things, right? Because there's not some utopia place that we reach. Um, maybe there's a moment, but that soon passes. <laughs> and so um, I think while the emotional and the physical pressure with sex and marriage, so we all have that, we can get really amped up. And, uh, you know, we just got to remember that the sky is not falling for most of us. There's a few guys out there that you guys have some really unique circumstances and I'm talking about really unique. And if you think yours is unique, you probably should talk to somebody else because you're probably going to find out it's not. Um, That's, I think, the number one thing. But there may be a few, you know, edge cases out there that that are really unique, but the sky is not falling for most of us. And, And I know so often I have felt that way. I've been in the moment, I'm all amped up, and I just think that life is is over. Um, and it's just not. Um, I think getting our eyes focused on the right and best things for our marriage. Um, every time, uh, there's been an interesting part of our marriage that uh, I tend to, um, I don't know how to describe this without it sounds weird, but I don't know if you ever feel this way, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a human being, so I have some selfishness inside of me. And I tend to think a lot of times that, that, uh, I'm I'm maturing faster than than my wife. And I think sometimes I am, like over time. And then what she'll do is like she does this leapfrog thing where like I think I am and I, I'm pretty sure I am. And then all of a sudden she's like 10 steps ahead of me uh because something that God's teaching her. And she goes so fast, she matures so fast in short periods of time, I take forever. So <clears throat> in saying that, the forever part for me in maturing is I've got to be in God's word. Uh, I can't like, I, I, that's, that's where we get renewed. That's where we get a new mindset, uh, memorization of scripture, having a few verses that, that you can repeat to yourself. I know, um, for me, it was a message that I heard a couple of years ago uh, that I even last year, maybe even when it talked about the idea of lust being an idol in your life. And, you know, God clearly says, have no other gods before me. And I was like, ooh, like I never thought of it that way. And it's true. And so I've got to have those verses and I've got to have accountability. Uh, I know there was a, we have different awards in the some of the ISI mastermind groups that we're in. And and uh, one of them was uh, a few years ago that I was, I was, I was uh, grateful to receive, but it was a weird thing it was, it was being most vulnerable, like most transparent. Um, because if we're not, if we don't have a group of people that we trust around us that don't have the same skin in the game as, you know, our, our people at work and our, you know, uh, people at church, even I want to say, and, and uh, that are right in our community, like right there. Um, hopefully we have some of those relationships that are that way and, and you treat each other fairly and can still show up, right? That, that, that would be the perfect thing. But if you don't having, a space where you can be really vulnerable and transparent and say the things you don't want to say out loud because it adds a whole layer of, layer of accountability for yourself when other people look at you and are like, yeah, you're right on that point, but that one there, like, you know, you, you got to think about that differently. And so having that accountability is, is super important. Um, we got to get our eyes off the things that destroy intimacy. Uh, I think, things like social mindless scrolling. Uh, oh. I think that's terrible. Like we are not yes. focused on each other or even anybody else around us. Yes. Like it yes. drives me crazy. Um, and it takes you places you don't need to be going, you're, right? You're 100% One, right. 
Yeah. Um, you linger too long. You're like, oh my gosh, you're tired. You're fatigued. It's like things are not going well anyway. What the heck? And you just like eating a whole bag of Cheetos, you know, well, right. since I'm eating, I just, and it's like, man, that is the enemy so tempting us. And so I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. I think being very mindful, um, there's been some really good books in the past that we've read as a couple and it's a book on you know marriage, but they'll have like one chapter on sexual intimacy, and they don't take enough time. And some of these books are like well known and popular, and we found very good things in them over the years. But around the sexual intimacy thing, I think in some ways they're a little misleading. And so, I just would be very mindful that as you're reading uh, the books that are out there, um, they're well intended, but I think uh, they do focus on the wife. Uh, just doing it more often, if you will. I hate to say that, but mm-hmm. but some of them do do that. And I think you need to be mindful when you're reading it of putting it in a truly biblical perspective, and mm-hmm. and um, you know not. I think there's like there's like two extremes. I remember uh, going to a ton of like we went to a number of marriage classes, and and uh, we would just walk away like, okay, husband, if you do what you're supposed to, your wife will follow, and that may be true in the average marriage. But for ours, we had kind of an edge case because of some abuse and my affair and all of that. So it was very com- it was very complicated and complex. Complicated, wrong word, but complex for sure. And uh, so it wasn't until Sonia re- recognized that like I wasn't going to be perfect <laughs> that that she right. felt like she could then uh, lean into mm-hmm. the relationship. So that bit of advice didn't help us for our specific case, but it took us years to work through that and figure it out. Um, I remember uh, Sonia going to uh, one of our pastor's wives um, back years and years ago at a church we were at early in our marriage and uh, struggling with intimacy even back then for obvious reasons. And, uh, you know, the, the, literally the answer to her was, uh, we'll just have more sex, it'll get better. Mm-hmm. And um, that seems like a valiant thing to say, but, uh, and there may be some elements of truth in that maybe. But for the most part, like, you need to find out what the issues were at the core that were causing it, not just try to force something to happen um, for us. And so, yeah, you want it real. You don't want it surface level. You don't it's not going to last. Hundred, if you don't get to the surface. Yeah, 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 not just surface level. And I think as a husband, am I making the the effort toward her needs as much as I expect her to meet to meet mine? Mm-hmm. Um, early on early on, probably 10 years into our marriage. Um, I can't remember where it was. We heard it, marriage conference, something that was really helpful was we had always thought of marriage being 50, 50. And um, the reality is it's not, it should be a hundred, hundred. 150, 150. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> but the point is, is that if I'm a husband, you know, eyes of a husband, right. am I looking at meeting her needs as much as I expect her to meet mine? Yeah. And yeah. so I think through communication Asking your wife what her needs are. We use this tool called sure. Needs and Values that's been very helpful in our marriage. Maybe they'll be get a link in the show notes or something for that. But just a really helpful tool uh, to help you yeah. understand your wife a little bit better. And um, yeah, so man, there's some other ones I could just go on and on. But uh, it, for the sake of time today, uh, I think a couple of them I'll finish up with is just being grateful. Uh, gratitude is definitely a key to reducing my selfishness and see the bigger picture that God's given to me for sure. Um, and then, uh, you know, a fun thing, uh, a lot of entrepreneurs and business owners listen on this podcast. That's what it's, that's what, who, who it's for is, uh, just a kind of a fun thing is, uh, leverage the opportunity of being a business owner or entrepreneur in your schedule. If you can, uh, there you, go. you know, um, if possible, you know, 10 PM sex after a long day of work, isn't the only option. Yeah. Um, no. you know, afternoon before Be kids get home or whatever, whatever you right. got to do to like lunch, get right. a, get a, get a babysitter for lunch or something. But you, you yes. as an option, I think you have some opportunities that, that you can take advantage yeah. of and leverage that are better for mm-hmm. you and your, in your life and your relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't have to be date at night and everybody's wiped out. You can, you can be creative and strive for mutual intimacy. I think, you know, don't per- expect perfection. You know, it's two people. You said this earlier, two, pe- two different people, doing the most vulnerable thing that you can. There's mm-hmm. going to be some challenges along the way. Mm-hmm. Wally, I think as we close today, just a summary would be that first and foremost, you need to have open communication. Mm-hmm. This is the first most important vital step that you could possibly take. It's not going to go away. Do not sweep it under the rug. 
And I want you, the listener, to initiate the conversation. Mm -hmm. Just show your spouse that she's important enough to schedule the time. Just go right now and go, you know what? Wally and Big A's right. This is important. It's not going to go away if I don't schedule some time with my wife. And just sit down slowly, or if it's a lady listening to this, sit down slowly with your husband and just say, hey, let's talk through this because we want to live that kind of life that they're talking about. We want it to be good. We want the arguing to go away. We got to have great communication. The other thing is, is if you need to, there's nothing wrong with seeking professional help. I promise you, I'm a testament to professional help. Wally, I know you are as well. It's something that's really helped us in our marriage. There are some people that need to go to a sex therapist. There may be some things in your life that you just can't resolve on your own or your friends don't have the experience. Be really careful with that too. Be careful of the friends that you take advice from. You want to be sure that their core values align with yours. You want to be sure your worldview is similar. Uh, you want to take advice from quality people. So really seek out a great person to take advice from. But then if the sex therapist is necessary, go to that. There's a lot of great ones out there. Uh, some of you may need to have a medical evaluation. You may need to go to the doctor, get a checkup, make sure you're okay. There's some challenges that I've experienced personally, and I don't mind saying so. As you get older, things just a little different than they are when you're younger, and you've got to get some medical assistance. And then finally, just educate yourself, whether it be books uh, that Wally's talked about earlier, other resources. Search those out, right? We have a whole litany of things that we can go to in order to do the research. So just really check that out. A lot of institutions and churches have workshops. They have retreats. Man, those things are amazing that you can go and kind of reset and kind of refocus, get the kids out of the picture, get the office or the workplace out of the picture, and really focus on each other uh, in order to accomplish the things that you want to. I know it's been a fun topic to discuss. It's a little bit difficult, but at the end of the day, our desire for each one of you is to have that intimacy that I know you were created to have. So if you get a chance, do these things, go slow, be very intentional about it, and I promise you, you too will have that view from the top that we talk about each and every week. Hey guys, we did not have time on the podcast today to cover every single little detail regarding this topic. We'll probably skip over, we probably skipped over some something that you feel is important or you may have a different or important insight to add or challenge us just on our way of thinking. So uh, please do so. We invite that. We want to know. And the way to do that is to join in the conversation at the View From The Top private podcast Facebook group. So you can link, there'll be a link to this to the group in the podcast show notes. Please click on that, go there, ask to join that. And uh, as long as you meet the criteria, we'll let you in and uh, you'll be able to join this conversation there and other great conversations uh, that we're having. So until next time, have an awesome, fantastic day.